listeners. My guest today is Dr. Ken Barr, an MIT-trained PhD in synthetic organic chemistry with several patents to his credit. At the time of this interview, he was the executive director and head of R&D and strategic global operations at Forma Therapeutics in Boston. I first met Dr. Barr in 2009 when he was at Merck working as a principal researcher at Merck Research Labs. I had the pleasure of partnering with Ken and several others on a project that resulted in a successful turnaround of a failing cross-border collaboration. Ken had a pivotal role in this effort that changed the trajectory of a multi-million dollar investment. In this podcast, we explore what it takes to lead under challenging circumstances. Listeners will learn about leading breakthroughs and the importance of courage in addressing the elephant in the room. If you have wondered why some leaders are better in shepherding transformation than others, this podcast presents several answers. I'm going to turn things over to Dr. Barr. Um, Ken, it's my pleasure to have you at, in our podcast today. Um, so tell our audience who you are and what you do. Uh, well, thank you, Shreya, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. It's, it's quite a privilege, and it's good to be connecting with you again. Uh, so my current role is with Forma Therapeutics, and for our R&D division, I'm the head of our strategic global operations. and. Uh, in that, there is a great emphasis on driving the research portfolio forward to discover new therapeutics, basically with a focus on looking at the interface between our internal research efforts and those uh, in the external world, primarily through contract research. Um, my prior role at Pharma, this was a relatively recent uh, transition. For the first four years I was with Pharma, uh, I was the head of R&D operations and planning. And in that role, there was uh, predominantly project and portfolio management. And as a member of the research leadership team, still very focused on driving the portfolio forward, um, also managing our R&D committee meetings where we're reviewing projects, putting best practices into place. Um, but in the operations role, it's interesting because at many companies, you'll have people who are heads of different scientific disciplines, such as a head of chemistry or biology or pharmacology. And in the operations role, it's really more about having a, a cross-functional view and understanding how to link all of those things together. Uh, to make sure that they're working well and in sync. And it's it's really building a lot of bridges and then understanding how all the parts fit together. Yeah, that's fantastic. And one thing I want to share with our audience, um, not only is Dr. Barr a well-known researcher in his space, but he's also um, someone who is very loved by his team. And, and I want to go through some experiences that we've had together working on projects where his courageous leadership changed the trajectory um, of the projects that we're working on, as well as the long-term success of the teams that he has led. Um, the other thing that is quite notable about his leadership style is the focus on using data to determine what needs attention rather than simply relying on his gut. And, and that, in my view, has led to several breakthroughs, particularly in um, turning around a failing partnerships and, and projects and teams and making them um, among the best that in, in the firms that he has worked at. So I want to start out um, asking you a question about courage. Um, your courage in addressing the elephant in the room, and I've seen you do that at least a couple times in the projects that we have been on together, um, um, your ability to address what's difficult has led to several breakthroughs in performance and, as I mentioned, the long-term success of the teams that you have led. Would you share with us um, what does courage mean to you? Thanks, Ray. I, I think at the very heart of it, in, in the way that I practice what you're describing, it really comes down to the ability to be very blatantly honest, to be able to call it like you see it and to be able to be very fair and upfront with people, but do it in a way that still transmits respect so that you can bring people along with you as opposed to have people feel as if they're being judged or attacked. 
Um, but the type of courage that you're describing in this context is oftentimes the courage to see things as they really are and then to help make other people aware as well. Because it's, it's only in having an honest assessment of, of where you are currently and then aligning around where you need to be that you can inspire people to move forward in the right direction. So, so one for our um, audience's benefit, I'm going to share without going uh, too much into the specifics of the project itself. Um, I, I first met Ken, um, hearing about him from his team um, before I had met him, but I actually saw his um, courageous leadership and wanted to get to know him better. This was in a very large meeting where two sides, two teams had come together to determine how they could um, change the trajectory that was not going very well. The two teams were not very successful. But there was a question that you raised, Ken, that changed the conversation, that took it to a level that allowed both sides to see what was going wrong. It also required sharing some very difficult news with at least one of the teams. And yet, in the end, um, you were still very loved, and it resulted in s several successes, including a patent. Is that right? Uh, yes, there were a number of patents that came out of that work, um, but more importantly, the identification of um, molecules that we could put forward to be evaluated as potential clinical candidates, which is really what the goal of the collaboration was. And, and, and what you had to do was not easy. In fact, any other leader, and there were several other leaders from your team uh, who were also in the room who did not speak up, but you did. And when you did, there was a lot of silence, but it also then opened up the conversation to what needed to be discussed. How did you decide in the moment that you're going to talk about the most difficult part that no one else was willing to address. Yeah, thank you for the question. I, I think what it really came down to at the time, and, and this has really been repeated for me in several instances since then, is uh, if I have a great commitment to the outcome, and I'm, I'm very interested in making sure that we get to the best possible place, and I have a vision for what that looks like, um, it's the ability to really help level set people for where we are, and oftentimes, and in the particular context that you're referring to, um, we had a team that was seriously underperforming or misdirected, um, but nobody had given them the feedback that would allow them to understand that and to course correct. And obviously the specific way in which you give people feedback will have a tremendous impact on how they receive it and how they choose to respond to it. But in this case, we were at a crossroads where we were either going to fix the collaboration and become a productive team that could be successful or we were going to have to terminate the collaboration. And so, in a way, you could say there was not much left to lose. Either we were going to, to be successful or it was going to end. And I, I think also being very overt with people about that and about my sincere intention to make it a very successful endeavor for both sides um, is what allowed people, I think, to have the confidence to at least listen. And then I have to say that, that a lot of credit goes to the team that was underperforming because they took it well and they responded and they made a determination to turn it around, which they very much did. I also want to talk about that because it's not only the, the courage, but you also led a team, a, a virtual team across two continents. And, and that by itself is another accomplishment. Uh, many, many people find it difficult to make virtual teams work, even if they're in the same time zone. Um, so actually, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, could, could you tell us, uh, you know, what did you learn from leading teams in India, in China, and in Hungary? Um, what are some things to make virtual teams work? Uh, so first and foremost, I think it has to do with the way in which you, you treat your colleagues. And one element that we didn't really go into detail on this, but I, I think it's very relevant in this context, is this was not a collaboration of equals. This was uh, a large pharmaceutical company, Merck, that was contracting with various, what we call CROs, contract research organizations, where we had hired them to conduct research on our behalf. And in the pharmaceutical industry, at the time that we were doing this work, there was a, a model that was ranging all the way from the, the highly directive, where we simply had project leaders that were telling them exactly what to do um, in terms of what to make and how to make it, or what to, what to test and how to test it, 
mm -hmm. uh, through to less commonly practiced, but the one that I prefer, the more collaborative model, where you really engage these folks as actual members of your team. And um, so treating them with respect as colleagues, sincerely being interested in what they have to bring to the table based on their experience and their skill sets, whatever those skill sets happen to be, uh, and then working from there. And in, in any leadership situation, I usually, um, kind of my internal mantra, I would say is uh, assess, empower, support. What is it that this person or this group can bring to the table? How do I really maximize what they can do and then support them to be successful? And I find over and over again, if, if you engage people in that way, it really allows them to, to optimize, become the most that they can be. So at the highest level, it really has to do, I think, with the way that you approach your colleagues. There are also some more mechanism-based or technical-based aspects of working with teams that are distal. Mm -hmm. um, one of those, I would say, is first, you, you really do need to be open to understanding differences between your own culture and the culture of the people that you're working with. And even after working with folks in India or China or other places for several years, I can't say that I'm an expert, but I have gained some sensitivities to trying to understand um, how they may view the world in a slightly different way and how that impacts the way they operate and where we can build the bridges. And in fact, that's how you and I met originally because um, we really needed to find a way to, to bridge the gap culturally and you had experiences on both sides of the ocean and that made a really big difference. Another um, maybe more mundane aspect of this is that I always insisted that my teams um, connected to me through video conferencing as opposed to simply voice. And I personally think that had a huge impact, especially when you're dealing with people who um, maybe English is or isn't their, their first language. But again, with the cultural differences, you can gain so much more of an understanding of how people are receiving your message and understanding your message, but even responding to it based on facial expression and body language in ways that you never can through voice alone. It also allows you to make sure that people remain very focused on the conversation because uh, oftentimes on, on voice-only interactions, people get distracted when it's not their turn to speak. They're looking at emails or they're checking their phone. You can't do that in a video conference, so it tends to make things more productive. But I, I think it's really more about personalizing things. And then in addition, you know, from, from the very start with the teams that I work with, uh, sometimes we have to, to change the paradigm in order to make it more successful. So, you know, back to that specific example that you, you and I were talking about with the CRO that was in India, I needed to have a higher level of performance, which meant that I needed to ask the PhD level scientists to actually go into the lab and participate in the research process directly. <clears throat> Whereas in, in the model that's more commonly practiced, um, that would not be true. That people at the level of PhD scientists are usually more uh, leaders that direct masters and bachelor's level scientists to work in a lab. That's very, very common in, in that space. And usually one PhD scientist will manage somewhere on the order of eight, 10, 12 or more associate level scientists. Because the team was, was really not performing, they were open to the suggestion that we rework it to more of a Western model, which is not mm -hmm. to say that there was an assumption that our model was always gonna be better than theirs, but I needed to offer some kind of change. And so I made a deal with the company and with my scientists, which was to say, if, if you could find me a number of PhDs who were willing to work in a lab to manage smaller groups of people and really be more integrated, um, then I would incorporate them as full team members, teach them everything that I could about drug discovery as opposed to that transactional model by just telling them what to do mm -hmm. and try to create them as an independent operating team. And so I put in front of them a career opportunity that they would not be able to realize with almost any other partner or even several other uh, project leaders at Merck. And I, I think it was, it was that opportunity and that vision of success. And then as we went through the process, they're actually gaining that knowledge and having that experience that was very satisfying, tremendously satisfying. And why wouldn't it be? It's the thing that inspires me. So it was absolutely the thing that inspired them. Um, that I, I think brought them along and created that, that sense of belonging and loyalty. Uh, and I'm very happy to say that I'm still in touch with many of those folks today, even several years later, and, and they're all doing quite well. That, you know, for the benefit of your audience, I want to highlight the three things that you brought up, which um, I, I know from our experience in those days, um, were the things that your team talked about as well, as, as what they appreciated about having you as a leader 
Um, first of all, you invested a lot of personal time in getting to know your team. I remember you played cricket with them. You, you used your weekends not to sightsee, but actually spend time with your team, uh, you know, visiting their homes. So you knew them at the personal level. Second thing is the thing that you just talked about, which is creating opportunities to exercise leadership. Um, I know in the science is the uh, terminology called vigilant leadership, and it's associated with scientific discovery. Because um, a lot of things happen in the lab, um, as you just mentioned, unless the leaders are there and, and able to um, redirect effort based on what was happening, a lot could be missed. And, and I recall that that was an important thing for you, which is to uh, make sure that the team leaders were not just at their desk, which might be more traditional in hierarchical cultures, but to actually be with their teams. Did I get that right? You did, and maybe there's one other way that I could follow up on that. You used the word hierarchy, and one of the things that I've noticed uh, that, that is a difference between the companies that I've worked with and where I've really enjoyed the work the most and the companies and the teams that I've worked with, particularly in Asia and India and China, is that those societies are much more hierarchical than ours in terms of their corporate leadership structure. And when I, when I came to this, the CRO that I was working with in India, uh, one of the first things that I noticed is that no matter who I had present from my team, and I, I spent a lot of time on the ground there, as you were mentioning, no matter who I had in the room for my team, initially, uh, whatever question I asked, everyone would immediately turn to the highest status person in the room and wait for them to answer. And as you can imagine, in many cases, that person really wouldn't know the detail, um, simply because they wouldn't have the benefit of being that close to whatever the topic was. But that was the way it worked. And it it was necessary for me uh, to break the paradigm to basically be able to create an environment where every single person in the room felt empowered to speak up, uh, to answer the question if the question belonged to them, and to participate in the conversation. And again, you know, it, it scales based on where you are and your level of experience and accomplishment, but everybody is on the team for a reason. And the way that I went about that initially was I had to separate the different tiers. So I would meet separately with the highest level directors. I would meet separately with my PhD group leaders, and I would meet separately with the associates, um, which was easier in India than China because of the language barrier. Uh, since I don't speak Chinese and a lot of the associates there are less fluent in English. Um, but, uh, but in India, it was, it was fairly easy to do that. And initially, they were quite intimidated, and it was really a challenge for them. But over time... Um, by doing things like you said, by playing cricket, by going to lunch, by doing things that weren't necessarily related to a scientific environment where they felt like they were going to be judged at every moment for their performance, we were able to build those personal connections. Um, I also made sure that the associates were always invited to the teleconferences and that we scheduled them at a time where they would be able to attend. So even if they weren't directly participating, they still felt like they were part of the process. And over the course of months, um, we did get to the point where everyone in the room felt that they had value, and the group leaders and eventually the directors also became very encouraging of that type of open communication. And uh, I understand from talking to the leader of that organization at the time uh, that that model proved to be so successful that they ended, that, ended up translating that to a lot of their other teams as well. Um, because it's, it, it was a change for them, but it's something they viewed as being very positive. Mm -hmm. so, so the opportunity part was the third part I just wanted to add add in, it, you know, it's the personal connections, the way the leaders led and creating opportunities for everyone to, to fully participate. You're listening to the Exponential Talent Podcast on the importance of courage in leading breakthroughs. Our guest today is Dr. Ken Barr. Now, a question back to you. When you first started working um, with these overseas teams, how did you figure out what's going to work? Well, that really was uh, initially some combination of um, intuition and a lot of trial and error. <laughs> a lot of trial and error. Um, I had only done a limited amount of outsourced research when I arrived at Merck, and then suddenly the, the bulk of my role was leading virtual teams that were located halfway around the globe. Um, it was very important to me to spend a lot of time on the ground getting to know my teams in person, and I still think that's, that's really critical because that personal connection is everything. And you know, I'll just take a slight diversion to say that there are a lot of folks 
who feel that, no, you, you should be able to do everything virtually. You can accomplish as much as you need to with email or with the teleconference. But I disagree completely. And the reason why I do is because if everything's working well, if they're delivering on what you've asked them to and, and they're on time and they're within spec, well, that's great. Then there's no issue and nobody has to worry about it. Um, but that's not how scientific research happens. You know, 99% of what we do is failure, and most of our time is spent trying to figure out how to course correct. And you need to be able to have those difficult conversations. And, and when I say difficult conversations, I don't mean difficult because I have to tell them they did something wrong. I mean difficult because we're trying to solve very challenging problems. And uh, I need them to be able to pick up the phone at any time, day or night, and to be able to talk to me about what's going on and, and what they're experiencing. And if you don't have a level of trust that comes from a personal interaction, they're, they're simply not going to do that because that's too uncomfortable. And there's, there's another element to this which has to do with a, a cultural difference that I, I learned over time. Um, and, and in fact, you were one of the people that helped me figure this out when we were doing our, our joint sessions together. Um, in the Indian culture, in the, the CRO culture, um, actually this is true in the teams I work with across Asia, there is this concept of not wanting to show failure, to, to, to be able to save face. That it, there's a sense that if we've asked them to accomplish a specific goal or a task or to take a project to the next step and, and they fail to do so in the promised time, that, that there's something wrong with them and we will view them as being lesser than. And so they will work very, very hard, first of all, not to let you know there was a problem so that they can, they can find an answer and then come to you with everything all worked out. Well, again, science is really difficult, and I was viewing these people as members of my team. In fact, I didn't have any team in the U.S. I only had these folks. So it was either going to work or it wasn't going to work. And uh, we had to be able to have those conversations around the challenges. And what I ended up having to explain to them after you helped me with the, the realization around the cultural difference is that for an American, if you don't tell us what's going wrong, we will view you as being deceitful or dishonest. That's just that's how our culture works. We view disclosure and transparency as being parallel with honesty. And uh, I think that was, that was just a, a misalignment, a, a misunderstanding. They weren't viewing it as being dishonest. They were viewing it as being so driven to deliver so they wouldn't be, per be perceived as being insufficient. And uh, we actually had that conversation and explained to them, no, that's not what that means to us. We're okay if you have problems. We're okay if you fail to get something to work but only by having that conversation can we figure out how to fix it. And for, for our teams, that, that made a huge difference, a huge difference. I'm glad you brought it up. I'd almost forgotten, you know, about the, the, the cultural aspect. I mean, it was an underlying theme that there were just different assumptions in operation um, on both sides, which resulted in, you know, delays or miscommunication. It's because of just the cultural assumptions where, so different and the other one was around frugality and and I don't know if you remember that that the India team would focus on on creating or you know doing more things in-house rather than and buying things to speed up the time and and then the US side time was what was of uh, importance yeah. that's absolutely correct and, and so it brings me back to another thing the way that we even engaged in this project human capital growth and, and Merck was Merck initially wanted a team building session. Um, and, and that's not something we do as evidence-based practitioners. We believe in focusing on the things um, that we know drive effectiveness. And um, what resulted was more sort of a mediated, facilitated conversation on specific things that were uh, not going so well and, and sort of addressing it or trying to find strategies to mitigate it. And, and I was you know, curious what you thought about that approach because a lot of these challenges, first of all, we had to identify it, bring it to the surface, and then have you know, people like you who, who really you know, courageously led the discussion on what the problem was and what needs to be done to solve it. Um, what did that feel like from your side rather than sort of doing you know, like an outbound activity where you are kind of trying to build relationships I think I understand the question. Um, there, there is a place for team building in terms of just establishing relationships, but in the instance that you're referring to, we had very, very specific problems that were not going to be easy to solve. And these were relationship problems now. I'm not 
referring to scientific ones. The scientific ones were there, that's why we were engaged with them to begin with. But um, the relationship wasn't working, and I had inherited that team from, from a prior project leader uh, who was very frustrated. And the frustration was actually in, in both directions. And again, um, my instructions on coming into this was either fix it or leave it, <laughs> right? Um, and so it was gonna be necessary to be able to have some type of conversation with them in a way that was going to help them understand that we did wanna to get to a much better place. But at the same time, to be very honest, that if we could not do that, um, then we would have to discontinue the relationship. And it was very helpful to have somebody who is familiar with both cultures uh, to help put that communication in the context so there was always an understanding of goodwill. And that was key. And, and that's our counsel to our clients, uh, you know, the more direct, as, as hard as it might be to address the challenges head on. Uh, but if you want to achieve breakthroughs, that's essential. You, you can't skirt what's causing the problem and hope that it'll go away. Yeah, and, and I would say that, um, you know, we've been talking somewhat specifically about this particular case and, and the relationship where you and I engaged, but my experience has been very similar since then um, in, in my current company, Forma, where um, until very recently I was, I was the head of R&D operations. A lot of my time was spent really integrating with the teams enough to understand what were the key challenges that they were facing and then to try to figure out how to make recommendations to get to a better place. Mm -hmm. And when you're on the leadership team and you're stepping into the environment of a project team's level, right, um, you want to be able to leverage your expertise and your experience to be able to help them get through the challenges that they're facing and to offer them things that they may not be able to bring to the table themselves simply for lack of experience or training in a particular way. But you also don't want to be viewed as somebody who's simply coming in to say, you, you folks don't know what you're doing, so I'm going to take over. And again, that kind of comes back to this, this concept of collaboration versus directive, that um, when I approach our teams today and we have to work through some of these challenges, I make a point and, and I'm very specific in my language and my, my actions, even my body language and facial expressions to try to be very clear that when I come into that space, I'm a member of the team. I'm not there to be the leader to tell them what to do. Um, I use very careful language to say, let me suggest for your consideration. I will often say things like, I'm just thinking out loud now. I'm not telling you that you should do this, but I'm, I'm kind of working through the process in my head and then you guys can think about this and help, help me understand how you feel about this. Even if I feel very strongly um, in my conviction about how right I might be, um, I never present it as if it's the solution. I only either present it as a question for them to try to address or as one proposal for them to consider among many. And of course, you have to be open-minded because there certainly are many times where there are counter proposals that are even better that the team aligns behind. And the truth is, You'll never know what the answer is until you run the experiment. So there's no reason to presuppose that I'm the only one who can come up with the answer. So the, the approach that I typically take is it's much less important to me that we get to the specific answer that I wanted than it is that we get to an answer, a plan, something that we can all agree to and, and align behind. And sometimes that's really all it takes. Mm -hmm. You just highlighted for us two key things. One is... Uh, transformational leaders tend to engage in one specific behavior that you've called out, which is to ask the question and rely on the team to come up with the answer, which takes them to a different place than where they came in with to you. Um, the second piece is about uh, humility. Humility and leadership, there's a lot of research in that space lately that leaders who are humble uh, rather than the macho kind for which there is a place, um, but, but the research is pretty clear that if you're humble, then uh, they tend to build better teams than those who uh, rely on their own um, sort of charismatic leadership to, to get everyone ahead. So those are the two things that for which there is a lot of evidence. Um, if more leaders practice these behaviors, they would achieve better outcomes. So in the interest of time, I, I want to check to see, is, is there anything else that you would like to add um, about courage and leadership? And then I have one last question for you. Thank you. I, I think on that particular topic, 
what I would say is, is that although it's sometimes outside our comfort zones, there's really no room for the fear of failure. And you just have to acknowledge that the worst thing that can happen is you'll get a negative result and you have to course correct. Um, but you know, from the scientific perspective, which I think applies in any aspect of leadership or other, even other industries, you do the experiment, you make the decision, and then you look to see what the outcome was, and then you figure out how to correct. And what I, there's a tagline in my emails that you've probably seen at the bottom, I've had it for years, which says, uh, there are no failures, only outcomes. And, and I really do believe that. And if you, if you have that orientation, uh, then you can let go of the fear of failure and just be free to collect the input of the folks around you, make a decision and move. And then if it wasn't the right decision, say, okay, apparently that wasn't the right decision. What are we going to do now? And, and own that as the group. I think where people really get held up is if they're so afraid of the eventual outcome that may not be the one that they want, that they're paralyzed to move. And I think that's where you get into trouble. And it's really not necessary. Mm -hmm. um, sticking your neck out doesn't necessarily mean your head's going to get chopped off. And if it does, then maybe you're in the wrong organization. So, so courage and fear in your mind go hand in hand. Yeah, in, in a way, I would say it's letting, letting go of the fear that allows mm -hmm. you to express the courage. Yeah. And it's and really that, that also that driving sense of urgency, right? We have some place to be. We have a vision for what we want to do. On the, the macro, it's about discovering drugs to treat patients. And you can really see the effect when you get to a drug and it goes into trials and you can see it working. And on the micro, it's just that one next step. But either way, you have to move in order to get there. Very powerful. So one last question to you. Um, team leadership, in your case, um, has been associated with R&D work, um, which industry-wide people would call that innovation. Specifically, what types of leader behaviors do you believe lead to innovation success? So I think that, that circles right back around to this concept of assess, empower, and support, right? So it is important because, you know, all of us do what we do because we, we have the privilege, of, like in my industry, we have the privilege of working in drug discovery because at the end of the day, it can be monetized, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that we are on the hook for delivery. It can't, certain, it can't just be a, a random search for an outcome. We also know, and I, I think the thing that inspires most of us to get up in the morning is the fact that um, we do have the potential to really make a difference in the world, to actually help people who are suffering, and that's, that's very inspiring. So I think that it really starts with being able to align everybody around a vision for what we're really trying to accomplish here. But then once people have kind of agreed on the vision and then understanding what role it is that each of us are going to play in the process, um, whether it's taking responsibility for being at some level in the leadership group or whether it's, it's being in, in the, the middle management section where you're really about making sure that all the details are lining up or whether it's in the execution side, we all have a really important role to play. And having the ability to assess each individual member on your team or in your organization from top to bottom and understanding what they're truly capable of helping them to orient in the right direction so that we're all working towards the same goals, the same outcomes, and then giving them the freedom to execute, I think is what opens the door to innovation. And we have to be able to take all of the ideas that come onto the table without judgment. Then we talk through them. We figure out what makes the most sense and what people can line behind. And we make sure that we're treating each other with respect. We can still debate, we can still argue, we can disagree, um, but we have to make sure that everyone is valued for what they bring to the table and that everyone needs the right to take something back with them that they can feel proud with, proud about. Uh, I think that's for me how you create an atmosphere where people can really succeed. And you know, I would say that uh, almost everybody in my organization in one way or another is smarter than I am. And I'm totally fine with that because all I care about is that we get to the outcome. Uh, and if you start thinking about people differently because somebody is a VP or somebody is a research associate or somebody is responsible for cleaning the rooms when everybody goes home, then you completely devalue what people can bring when they're working at their best. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I hope that answered your question. So you not only talked about um, being a leader uh, to inspire and, and ways to inspire innovation, but also uh, what you expect from each other, which is to let the best ideas surface. 
um, doesn't matter who you are and let people do their best work. Um, so to some extent, it, others have to take responsibility in the process as well. Absolutely. And the people that I think will be most successful on the teams that I work with or lead are the people who are going to be really inspired by that opportunity. And some people aren't, and that's okay, but then they're probably not going to be a good fit for what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. So I want to circle back. Um, the project that you and I worked on, it's almost uh, nine years uh, at this time. Um, so the collaboration that uh, you and uh, several of your team members from Merck uh, were trying to rebuild eventually lasted for uh, seven or eight years after that uh, particular intervention. So um, lots of success, and it was truly we were fortunate to be part of that journey um, and, and contribute in a small way. So, so we want to thank you for that, and it's been a truly a wonderful friendship to have known you all these years, to have um, uh, so, sort of uh, tracked the projects as well and see how, you know, the work that we began nine years ago, um, how that may have contributed or, or helped your teams. And, and it's just always a joy to speak with you. So thank you. Oh, thanks, Shreya. It's a sincere pleasure. I always love the opportunity to connect and uh, hope I get a chance to see you in person again soon as well. Likewise. Well, thank you, Evan. That's it, listeners. That was our Exponential Talent podcast on the importance of courage in leading breakthroughs with Dr. Ken Barr. Life presents many occasions to show up courageously, and when we seize the moment, it can make the difference between success and failure. Hope you found value in the lessons that Ken shared. There are many takeaways, particularly for leaders who work in cross-border teams. If you enjoyed this podcast, don't forget to subscribe. Come back again and join us the next time. Goodbye for now. This is your host, Shreya Sarkar Barney.